Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Purcell, and I'm also a member of the Second Collisions Organising Committee. My day job is leading the communications office for CERN Open Lab. I'm delighted to be with you now to open the first thematic track of the event, which is space. 57 CERN alumni have indicated that they work in the space sector. So I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Pippa Wells, Deputy Director for Research and Computing at CERN, who will introduce the first speaker of this track. Incidentally, Pippa will be hosting one of the Meet the Management tables on Sunday at 2 p.m. Central European Summer Time. So over to you, Pippa. Thank you, Andrew. And I'm really delighted to be here with you all at Second Collisions to introduce our first alumni speaker of the event, who's joining us from California. Shannon Taui is a systems software engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Her current role saw her contributing to the engineering operations and ground data system development for the Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars in February of this year. Prior to that, Shannon spent a year at CERN from 2015 to 2016 as a detector technologist working on the Atlas tile calorimeter. We're going to have a 20 minute presentation and then there'll be 10 minutes for question and answer. So please do put your questions into the chat. Thank you, Shannon. The floor is yours. Hi, um, thank you so much, Pippa. Um, and I want to thank everyone at CERN uh, for having me um, here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Mars 2020 um, or Perseverance Rover and my experience working on software development um, for that mission. Um, so yeah, my presentation is up now. Um, and again, yes, I want to um, say a little bit about myself. Um, I was at CERN from 20, sorry, I don't think the clicker is working, one second. Um, I, have, I was at CERN from 2015 into 2016, um, working during run two on operations um, for Atlas, specifically, in the um, U Chicago group. Next slide would be great, thanks. Um, so here's a couple of um, pictures of me at JPL. Um, I uh, was started working there in 2016. Um, and so here on the left, there's a picture of me in the mission control room when we were doing some tests for uh, service operations for Mars 2020. Um, this was pre-COVID, so uh, I was not actually in mission control during our actual landing uh, period. Um, on the right, you can see a picture of me with um, one of Curiosity's um, twin rovers that we have at JPL. Um, JPL uh, tests rovers that, um, for in terms of like mobility testing, um, path detection. Um, we have sort of twins of the rovers on Mars to replicate problems that we see on Mars um, back on Earth. Um, so that's one of the uh, test rovers um, that we use there um, in that picture on the right. Um, next slide. Um, here's some other uh, missions I've worked on at JPL. Um, my first experience at JPL was uh, with a mission um, in the top left, the uh, MRO, which is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, that's a very important um, asset to NASA's Mars program. Um, it supports a lot of relay operations for the landers and does a lot of science on its own. Um, my first experiences at JPL um, were in college in undergrad, um, and I worked on this system um, that you can see on the right, um, which is a, a camera polarimeter system for SOFIA, um, which is the airplane that you see there. Um, it's a uh, basically an astronomical observatory that detects in the infrared. Um, and I was working on um, a validating the, a camera system for it um, that you can see there. Um, and again, I was at CERN um, 2015 and 2016 working on Atlas, um, and I consider it a very like, a formative experience for me and um, definitely has shaped my path um, professionally since then. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about Mars 2020, the science goals 
that we're um, trying to accomplish on the mission and a little bit about the software development um, that I've been working on uh, personally uh, since um, 2016 or so. All right, so next slide. So Mars 2020 is the latest mission to Mars in a long uh, suite of missions that NASA has been sending to Mars. Um, so in every mission, we've um, been trying to uh, do something new on the surface of Mars. Um, we can see here that on the orbiter side, um, we have a lot of uh, missions that are supporting our operations um, from orbit. And uh, we've uh, recently um, been able to make the next step in Mars exploration with Mars 2020. And right, uh, next slide. So um, this is a um, slide about the overall science goals of the Perseverance rover mission. Um, previous missions like Curiosity has have done a lot of work um, in the geology side um, and uh, with making scientific observations on the surface of Mars. Um, but Mars 2020 pushes that forward um, with uh, their new suite of instruments and being able to uh, do sample caching, uh, which is a new ability to uh, Mars 2020. It has never been done before on the surface of Mars. Um, basically, we're drilling cores um, into Mars rocks, um, storing the, the cores uh, in a sealed cache that we will um, later pick up uh, with a different a mission to Mars and bring back to Earth. Um, and so this is an interesting like engineering problem um, in how to actually steal samples from Mars um, and how to actually execute that activity on Mars. Um, it's not, uh, definitely took some uh, more technology development. Um, and so we're excited to actually be able to um, provide these like samples there are actually two that have been taken recently uh, successfully. Um, and so this, this mission did uh, land in uh, um, earlier this year, but we've only taken samples uh, in the past month or so. Um, so it's still kind of a new capability and um, working through the uh, various uh, operational challenges uh, to actually taking samples on Mars. Um, and additionally to that, we want to prepare for humans uh, to travel to Mars. That's a long-term goal of NASA um, and the U.S. Space Exploration Program. Um, and in order to do that, we want to be able to demonstrate these technological abilities um, of operating on Mars at a high level and also launching something back from Mars um, autonomously. And so that's like a, a, a goal of um, the mission that we will send to pick up the samples um, on Mars that Perseverance is taking and um, put them into orbit and then deliver them back to Earth uh, through a new uh, vehicle. Um, all of that sort of end-to-end -end work um, will be able to demonstrate that we can sustain a, a mission on Mars that uh, is, uh, you know, s not quite as complicated as human life, um, but definitely something that we want to demonstrate we can do with robots. Um, before we send humans to Mars. All right, next slide. Um, this is just a overall uh, mission timeline for Mars 2020, um, just to show that it's, you know, how long it's been in development. Um, I worked on Mars 2020 since I joined JPL back in 2016, um, working on ground data systems, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail later. Um, but the various steps for the mission landing, um, Many of them happened during COVID, and so that was an additional challenge. Uh, we launched July 2020 and landed in February 2021. Um, and so that whole time, the whole team was working remote um, for the most part. And so um, it was a good um, challenge uh, that we didn't anticipate um, having to support operations um, totally remotely. Um, currently, we are in service operations. Um, as of a couple of days ago, Mars has uh, went you know, behind the sun, uh, which is a, what we call solar conjunction, um, which is like a time where we 
uh, really pare down operations on the spacecraft that are on Mars because we cannot communicate with them. Um, and so um, right now we're kind of in a uh, like sort of holding stasis until we come out of solar conjunction in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're, you know, continuing to do more science on the surface of Mars and um, to um, work on getting uh, more samples to support the uh, mission success, which is 20 samples um, in the prime mission of the, uh, of the rover. All right, next slide. Um, so here's like, here's a rendering of the rover on the Martian surface. Um, we have um, a lot of interesting capabilities on the rover that have not been seen on Mars before. Um, and um, one of them is the like, improvements in the, in the systems themselves that I've been working on uh, since Curiosity. We inherited a lot of the Curiosity um, ground software um, abilities and expanded on them to be able to um, have the rover operators um, more quickly determine what activities they should do um, per day. So the rover planning happens on a you know, daily basis um, with the exception of like weekend holidays um, and sometimes we'll send multi-sole plans. Um, but for the most part, we uh, have the rover execute activities um, that we decide the day before. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works um, later on in the presentation. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just a, an image of the robotic arm relative to the size of the rover. So Perseverance is around the size of an SUV. Um, it's a large vehicle. Um, it's around the same size as Curiosity, um, but the robotic arm that you can see here stretching out um, is definitely a little more advanced uh, from Curiosity. And what we do on it with the surface is that, you know, we turn it, um, it has the drills, drill bits on it um, and a couple of, uh, or one instrument on it. Um, that we can use to do, you know, very close experiments, um, Martian surface, and to take samples of the Martian surface. All right, next slide. I also want to mention um, the Ingenuity helicopter. So this was a really exciting um, tech demo that was uh, an addition to Perseverance. Uh, we stored it under the belly of the river, and we were traveling to Mars and landing on Mars. Um, it's now it's um, in operations for, like since we landed, um, it's done a really excellent job um, at taking images and demonstrating our ability to fly autonomously in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, Ingenuity is the first um, helicopter or powered vehicle that has ever been flown in another planet's atmosphere. So it's really exciting um, to just have it being successful um, but even outside of just its own mission success, it's provided a lot of helpful information to the rover, um, or the rover planning team so far, um, in terms of the scouting it's been able to do of um, various regions that we may or may not want to drive to. Um, and so it's been very cool um, to have the helicopter be a part of the mission and um, definitely a good sign of success um, in our ability to fly in, in other atmospheres. All right, next slide. So in, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about operations on um, Mars 2020 and for all of our missions in Mars. Um, so the uh, every mission outside of um, really like low Earth orbit relies on this network of detectors called the Deep Space Network. Um, this image is a picture of one of the uh, uh, receivers on the DSN. Um, and every day we get these uh, downlink um, bunches of data, like telemetry data on the engineering side, and then some science data um, back into these re uh, these receivers. Um, and they give that information back to JPL and what we can detect on the ground. Um, and so this is a an interesting, like, you know, definitely a necessary part of the infrastructure of all space operations. The DSN supports all of JPL's missions that are um, in deep space, which we consider everything past Earth. Um, and 
uh, they we, we definitely rely on on that system on the ground um, in order to actually do operations on Mars. Um, next slide. So how the data gets back to the ground on Earth is through a network of um, of orbiters on Mars. Um, this graphic is a little out of date. Um, we have a, a few orbiters um, that we relay data up to. Since the orbiters have a much larger um, antenna on them, like they have more bandwidth for sending data back to Earth than if we had sent them from the rover uh, specifically. And so um, this is another area of um, technology development and also um, just operational awareness of missions to Mars um, requires sort of a, um, a link up to orbit in order to deliver all of the science that they're able to do. Um, and so we rely primarily on um, MRO and TGO and Odyssey um, to deliver the data that we collect on the surface back um, to Earth. All right, next slide. Oh, I'm running low on time. <laughs> All right, so uh, my role in Mars 2020 was um, on ground data systems. So that's basically everything that we've developed um, to uh, track what the rover actually did, analyze the, the downlink telemetry from the rover on the engineering side, um, and then be able to uh, reliably and quickly develop plans for the next day in the rover's life. Um, so this is just like a little sketch um, from uh, a few years ago of, um, you know, what, what the room would look like. And um, now it's all kind of virtual. Um, but we uh, basically just want to um, develop a suite of web applications that are accessible from, um, you know, everywhere outside of lab and our uh, international partners and have them be able to be able um, to tell what happened the previous day in the rover's life, uh, whether or not the rover is healthy, um, and to develop a, and uh, sequence and validate new activities for the rover in a, a way that's um, you know efficient. Uh, a lot of the work that I did was on the downlink side, um, basically developing an application that would determine from like the telemetry that we got, which is essentially a long list of logs, um, what commands were executed successfully, um, and what the current parameter state on the river was, um, which is important for you know validating new sequences. Um, all right, next slide. I think I have another slide. Um, yeah, so this is just a, a summary. Um, Mars 2020 is definitely the next mission in our, or the current mission in our long um, overall strategy of learning more about Mars. Um, we want to be able to support the ambitious science goals um, of Mars 2020, which on the engineering side takes, like, took a lot of um, development um, in order to um, support planning and support um, the science teams getting the information that they need in order to determine things like where um, if Mars harbored life in the past, um, how we could detect it um, and determine the best way forward for human missions to Mars. And um, that is it. I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, so I just want to uh, reiterate that um, I have definitely um, benefited from my uh, experience at CERN in um, operations at LHC. Um, a lot of that sort of early in my career carried over into um, operational uh, philosophies um, that I learned at JPL um, and how to run complex scientific missions um, is something that we share in common. Shannon, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. And I'm just amazed that your, your equipment, the software you've worked on and everything is the other side of the sun at the moment. That's hard to believe. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Um, maybe let's just start with that. How, how long does, do signals take to get from Earth to your equipment at the moment? 
and and how does that affect your way of working yeah it varies um based on where mars is relative to earth but minimum it's around seven minutes um light time and maximum it's around 20 minutes for one way light time um so yeah a, a large part of the challenge in the software our planning side is that we can't you know control the rover um in real time everything that we send to the river has been developed like a day before um and with very like few exceptions so um we definitely uh have the challenge of not knowing the complete information when we do planning for the next day um which is a um something that we, we try to capture um in the planning and just making the planning more conservative Because I do remember, I think it was back in 1998, I was in a museum and they had a mock-up of the, fir the first rover and you could, you could send it signals and they'd only put a delay of like a minute and it was incredible how confused you'd get. You'd say, turn left and nothing would happen and half the time you were picking <laughs> up instructions that someone else had sent, you know, previously. So you showed, awesome. you showed us that fantastic timeline. Um, What's the most exciting moment? Is it lift off, landing? How, what's the mood? Like? I think it was. I think it was definitely landing. Um, although launch was definitely a bit stressful. <laughs> uh, we had an anomaly shortly after launch um, because our uh, we had we had an alarm set um, to a threshold that was pretty um, likely to. Um, it, it, the river was like likely to exceed that threshold when it was so close to Earth, um, and so that was like a little stressful. After we launched, um, we didn't have like the sort of smooth transition to um, normal communications that we expected. Um, landing, on the other hand, um, went exceptionally well. I think about as well as a landing on Mars could go, um, where we got images back that we requested um, pretty much right away. Um, that was definitely a really exciting moment um, because when, like JPL has landed on Mars before the uh, system for landing for um, Perseverance was borrowed heavily from Curiosity, the sky crane um, system, which basically uh, they flew um, a, a vehicle into the Martian atmosphere that, um, you know, lowered the rover to the ground on a, on a steel cable or steel cables. Um, and that, you know, despite our uh, um, optimism and, and belief in that system working, it was still definitely a scary um, moment to actually, it has to go off autonomously, you know, end to end, we land. So we're just, it was, it was definitely a waiting around kind of, um, kind of moment and very tense. Um, I was in my apartment then most of the team was, uh, supporting remote. We did have some people in mission control, but due to COVID, um, most of the operations team has been remote the whole time. So um, that was like an additional uh, challenge that we didn't anticipate when we were developing systems and just having, you know, everyone have to um, participate remotely. Um, but the March 2020 team was really excellent. And, um, you know, everyone has done a really good job um, since landing or before landing um, to get the rover like very operational very quickly. Um, so it's a remarkable team to be a part of. So Shannon, you've, you're in a unique position here because you've worked is, with, with space missions and you've had experience of running accelerators and e equipment at CERN. You showed us a little picture of your control room, which looked as it had, what, 10 people in there or something? Is that just a day, a, the daily meeting or is, are there people there around the clock? How does it work and how does it compare to CERN where we really are trying to run the experiments 24 hours a day? Yeah, so we do have 24 seven support um, in mission control for a DSN um, a person to monitor our, you know, our network of telescope, of radio telescopes that actually collect all the data. Um, that is going on 24 seven. Um, in terms of operations, uh, when the rover first landed on Mars, a lot of the team um, who had to go to lab to actually, um, you know, send send sequences and commands to the rover, they were working on Mars time, um, which is basically 
uh, the the rover sleeps at night to conserve power, and so um, its its daily life has to be planned um, on its time. <laughs> and so a lot of our team was was going to a lot of our team that had to go to JPL was working there um, on Mars time. The, the Martian day is forty minutes longer than Earth, so um, in um, that resulted in them having to go to work 40 minutes later every day. And so our schedule would shift um, when things were due, you know, all through the day. So it was okay if it was during working hours, um, but then like a week or two later, they would be, you know, working in the middle of the night. Um, and so that was like a little, a little stressful. Um, now we've um, been able to check out all of the systems on the river and um, operations were going pretty smoothly. Um, and so, uh, we were able to transition off of Mars time um, into, you know, everyone working on, on Pacific time, uh, which is a lot more um, sustainable for the team. But yeah, I think compared to... Okay, so... Um, yeah, compared to... Um, yeah, uh, compared sorry, to the, a... um, sorry, I think I'm on a delay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think we definitely... Um, you know, have, have a shared experience of 24 seven operations. Um, but at JPL, there's definitely a focus on trying not to, <laughs> to stay in 24 oper 24 seven operations for too long, because then um, people don't don't appreciate having to come into work later every day. Okay, so there was a question that zipped by on the chat saying, what, what was the transition like going from particle physics to another area? I, I mean, may, maybe space science is has a lot of similarities or is it completely different feel? Yeah, there were definitely some similarities. Um, I would say at CERN, the sort of op like so software that was used for operations back when I was there was like a little more like ad hoc. Um, I was working specifically on TileCal. And so we had our, our own system for TileCal, you know, calibration and detecting problems with the detector um, during run two. And so we were pretty much just focused on that alone um, in my group. And so um, that was definitely a little different um, from JPL, which is a lot more uh, institutionalized um, in terms of the systems that they support and the amount of people um, that they have to build out systems. Um, all of the ground data systems uh, from Mars 2020 basically new, um, built from scratch over the past four years. Um, and that required a team of around 100 software engineers. Um, and so that, like, just like the scope of the problem um, is like a little different from CERN. Um, but I think a lot of the goals are the same um, to be able to uh, meet scientific needs flexibly and um, be able to like do development on the software side when, um, you know, hardware and other systems are still being developed in parallel is definitely something that uh, we see it at CERN as well. And so I think a lot of that experience um, carried over um, and CERN definitely um, being around during during run two, like during operations, um, definitely, um, you know, set the, um, the bar high for my expectations for um, a team um, that was running scientific experiments. Um, and so I, you know, I consider that a very uh, good experience that I had um, and something that I think a lot of engineers working on LHC projects, um, uh, you know, can relate to and can translate over into space. Okay, thanks very much, Shannon. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, and I think I could carry on asking you questions for hours. But we've got a massive program ahead of us here on Second Collisions. So thanks to you. Thanks to the people asking questions. Um, enjoy Second Collisions, everybody. Yes, thanks, everyone, for having me. This is great. <laughs>